Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of The Late Sub with Claire Watkins. I am your host. It is Monday, March 11th. We have so much to discuss. Some truly epic battles in NCAA conference tournament matchups. We've got some champions to crown. We've got some real intensity to to dig into and and the fallout of what happens when emotions run high. Uh, We have a Gold Cup champion to crown as well. Congratulations to the U.S. Women's National Team for turning it around. And then we have a quick, fun preview. Some of the broader storylines for the NWSL. That's right. The NWSL is coming back this week. Spring has sprung. Let's get into it. So first, we need to dive into the week of conference tournaments in women's basketball. That's right. Four of the Power Five conferences have a conference tournament winner. It was an incredible week of women's basketball. I really, really enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it on the conference networks throughout the week. I enjoyed catching it on national TV once we got to the final beautiful day of, of basketball, especially on Friday and, and Sunday. It was it was nonstop, and I, I had a blast. It was great to also just kind of do a speed run catch up on some of these teams to see where they're peaking at the end of the uh, regular season, beginning of the postseason before things get really real in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, I think there's the biggest story coming out of the weekend, and this one you guys have probably already heard, probably seen the the footage of and seen other people already comment on. This is the big news cycle moment, which was the SEC championship game between South Carolina and LSU. This was obviously a blockbuster even before the game began. You've got last year's national champion. You've got this year's undefeated team. You've got close SEC rivals where one team has had the the better of the other for a very long time. South Carolina has has beaten LSU. I think it was was like the last 15, 16 games. Kim Mulkey has never defeated South Carolina as the head coach of LSU. So there's a lot of narratives there. Also just, I think, interesting that Angel Reese was given SEC player of the year and defensive player of the year going into this. So a lot of individual narratives, a lot of team narratives. South Carolina does win this game. They are still undefeated. They had a very dramatic week. They had to hit a buzzer beater against Tennessee uh, to make it to the championship game. They do win this game. But the thing that, that people are talking about now in in the wake of Sunday was an altercation that happened at the end of the game. It was about two minutes left in the fourth quarter. It had been a very physical match. South Carolina had the momentum, I would say. They were pulling away a little bit. There's an intentional foul by Flage Johnson of LSU against Malaysia Full Wiley, who had been playing very well so far in that game. Then when, when Johnson is walking off the court, She bumps into Gamecock sophomore Ashlyn Watkins. Then Gamecock senior Camilla Cardoso comes in, pushes Johnson to the ground. This results in both teams crowding around the scorer's table. Coaches separate the teams from there. That that was really all of the contact, mostly between the, the, the two teams. It was more just the teams came in, they crowded, and then coaches were able to pull everyone away. Uh, ejections were sum- summarily handed out. The big one was to Cardoso. She was given a DQ for fighting, which means that she will also be suspended for South Carolina's first game of the NCAA tournament. But they also cleared the benches for the violation of leaving the bench area while technically a reserve at that point in the game. This resulted in the entirety of LSU's bench being ejected. It resulted in South Carolina's all but one player being ejected. Shout out to Sanaya Fagan, who did not leave the bench area entirely. She kind of drifted to the end of the bench and and, and stopped there. So they had six players to end. LSU had five. But then South Carolina saw out the game. They already had the lead. They saw out the lead that they had already established. They win the game 79 to 72. So a lot going on here. I think you have to look at the conditions that led to the altercation, right? Like I had mentioned before, it was a very physical game. I said last week to get ready for the refs, and, and the refs are are refing. I think people people were going through, they were doing kind of the, the private investigation work that you do after an altercation like that and finding all the instances of physicality in the game prior to, to emotions bubbling over. It was on both sides. You know, there was a lot of physicality in the paint. Angel Reese and Cardoso had been battling the entire game up until that point. There had been some talking between the two of them. It was something that the refs kind of let play out. I got to say again, having watched 
many, many of these games this week. That is kind of the MO for the most part. I think we also know that sometimes the refs swallow their whistle late in the game because they don't want to impact the result in a negative way. They then handle kind of the the scrum, post-scrum, they handle it very by the book, being just very technical with what they did with the benches, being very technical with what they did with Cardoso. Clearly, Cardoso being the one to get the only DQ and Johnson not getting that, you can say probably is an indicator of what people saw in the video in terms of, of who kind of instigated and who escalated. But I think you can also certainly point out to the fact that retaliation sometimes gets noticed and punished. That's something that you could say probably in terms of Cardoso pushing Johnson to the ground in that way. It was very chaotic. There was a brief court invader, uh, which was reported to be Johnson's brother. He was escorted away from the court immediately. So it was all kind of a mess, kind of a mess. But also I I do think that, that, you know, a coach like Don Staley of South Carolina does a good job of getting people calmed down pretty quickly. They were able to, to restart the game. It just took maybe like 19, 20 minutes, but the rest of the game actually kind of played out in sort of a, a normal way, I would say, and more more on the game itself in a second. But I just do also just want to say kudos to the players on both teams for for after letting emotions bubble over, reining it back in, handling business. And, and it really didn't get more out of hand out of that sort of initial altercation, uh, which I think is a testament to both the players and the coaching staffs. There's been a lot of, you know, after a game like that, after people see that on national TV, People go right to the coaches to see what they're going to say post game. I thought Don Staley's statement was very, very good. She opened with a quick apology. She talked about how even things specifically like the the leaving of the bench area. You know, she says that her players know that's not okay. They're going to talk about that. They also talk about reining their emotions in. I think this is actually very consistent with Staley's approach with this team all year. She's been very candid about the fact that they are an emotional team. They're a pretty young team. And they don't necessarily have that one person like Aaliyah Boston, like they had last year, who I think she said, you know, would be playing like both ref and and coach out there and, and keeping everybody calm and collected. Kim Mulkey of LSU, I think everyone saw was slightly less apologetic. Uh, she definitely turned some of the blame to the referees. You know, she basically said, we foul, they foul. The refs weren't calling anything. What do you think is going to happen? But she she was le- it was less apologetic from from Kim Mulkey. So I think people are going to take away what they take away from from this particular scuffle. But let's look ahead a little bit. I think the bigger question is like, what does all of this mean going forward? Because the game is played. South Carolina wins. Confetti falls. Nets come down. What happens next? And, and I'm really interested in what this means for both South Carolina and what it means for LSU. Starting for South Carolina, like I said, I think they have the right coach in place to help them through something like this. Staley is one of the best personality managers, culture managers in the game. And I think it's a a testament to the entire season that she's been able to keep this group focused through a a difficult, difficult regular season and difficult tournament. I think she's going to rein things in. I think they're going to learn from this. I also just think they have huge positives to take out of the SEC tournament. They came about as close as you possibly could to losing without actually losing. And if you're looking for those, I, I think I talked about this last week, those like L's that turn into lessons. seems like South Carolina got those without actually having to take the loss. They were down to Tennessee with one second left in the semifinal. Cardoso banks her, her first ever career made three pointer. They get that win. That's how you instill confidence and momentum going into an NCAA tournament, especially when you know that your record doesn't always reflect exactly the games that you've played. And they competed with, with LSU throughout the final. They, it was like they were handling themselves really, really well until that moment that they weren't. I think you have to look at a, a player like full Wiley, who's, who's a freshman who came in and, and really turned the game around. She was playing with a lot of freedom. She was burning LSU pretty quickly. And, and I think it's also just a testament to the team that, that finished the game out. Like I said, it, it was sort of a, a stra- so still strange, still kind of surreal, but slightly mundane finish to the game itself, which is that uh, South Carolina maintained their lead and LSU couldn't chip into it. And by the time they were under one minute, LSU, I think, you know, they decided not to foul. They kind of conceded the point. So there are positives for South Carolina coming out of this tournament, big ones, I think that they're going to carry into the NCAA tournament because this is the time to, to learn these lessons and this is the time to, to regroup. They have time to cool off. I do think, though, however, when something like this occurs for a team as high profile as South Carolina, 
this kind of stuff now does probably go into the scouting report for the other teams that are going to be playing them in the tournament. Whenever you're playing a team that's as good as they are, as deep as they are, that can make the rotations that they make and hit you inside and outside, you're probably always going to be trying to goad them into mistakes. If you know that the refereeing has not been particularly sharp, I think you might start trying to goad them into emotional mistakes. I, I do think that that is is a, a way that another team can try to to dig into perhaps a lead or or an established style of play that one particularly good team can play. Things are very tightly wound in March Madness. We've seen calls go teams way, not go teams way. I think for Cardoso, um, I, I don't think that her missing that first game in the tournament is going to hurt them much. I think they're going to get through that game fine, but I think that she is now going to have some attention on her that she might prefer that she not have. And, and so, so it, it's, it's, I, I feel, I feel two types of ways about this for South Carolina. I think obviously, I, I think Staley said it perfectly. I think that it's a shame that there was a bittersweet element to them winning this championship. I think that they, they need to learn from this in order to not have these kinds of things repeat in the NCAA tournament, because I think that when other people, when other teams put their game plan together, this is going to be part of the scouting report. I stand by it. I still think they're the team to be. I don't think that coming close this close to losing and finding ways to pull it out should not be credited with kind of the same amount as we do like blowout wins. I think that South Carolina is a perpetually interesting and compelling team. So I wouldn't bet against them in March coming away with this for LSU. However, and I think this is perhaps, I hope this is a fair point in the context of sort of the, the way that Mulkey approached those post-game comments and again, being less apologetic, being very assertive and feeling good about the basketball that LSU is playing. Angel Reese, I think, took the same tack. It seemed like they were kind of fired up at the end of that game despite losing it. And I think those are the kinds of locker room things that LSU likes to do. Those are the kind of positioning things that LSU likes to do to get them into a mindset that is aggressive for March. However, this was just outside of this, this altercation, outside of the, the drama, I think this was just another clutch loss for LSU. In some ways, LSU benefited from this, this scuffle, right? If you kind of look at it, like I said, the, the thing that, that instigated the actual altercation was an intentional foul that an LSU ma- player made because they were about to get burnt on a breakaway layup on a turnover when they were already losing by a player that had been burning them the whole game. So if we're talking about emotions, that, that was a frustration foul. That was, you know, and Mulkey called it smart, right? It's, it's again, it's, it's all about positioning. That, that, was, that was an emotional foul on its own. South Carolina was pulling away. Then you have this big 19 minute break that, that breaks kind of all momentum out of the game. I'm not acting like LSU came out of that with a ton of momentum either. Right. They, they finished the game with five players, but you get a, a reset to, to put a game plan together. You've got your five starters out there. They've just lost their starting center. The only ejection went against your opponent. And I thought maybe we would see LSU start to start to chip away, start to dig in, start to make those those gritty calls to to make the game really interesting at the end because they were were kind of given this reprieve. The emotions were on their side, those heightened emotions that they showed after the game. You thought maybe this is when LSU makes it interesting, but that's not really what happened. And some of that mismanagement of those clutch, I mean, I, I say clutch like like a sub five point lead a five point lead with with five minutes or less to go we saw LSU struggle with that I'm not sure actually it got quite to clutch minutes against South Carolina in their first meeting in the regular season but people remember some of the strange decisions that that Mulkey made on the bench in that game and LSU wasn't really able to not only not pull it out but they were not within three to five points by the very end of that game they only have one clutch win on the season it was against Virginia in November and I've I've seen I've watched some of these losses. I've seen the two South Carolina losses. I watched the Colorado loss at the very beginning of the season. I saw the loss to Auburn in the SEC regular season. And and when LSU gets stuck in these battles, when Plan A isn't working, they're so good at blowing teams out because they are so talented. Anissa Morrow had a fan. <laughs> Anissa Morrow had the performance no one will remember <laughs> in a losing effort in this game. She was great. But when that's not working, when they're not getting that edge, I don't know if they're equipped to make the right calls, make the smart basketball IQ plays. And that, that does come from timeouts. That comes from the coaching. That comes from those decisions that are being those X's and O's that are being carried down to the players. I, I just haven't seen that yet this season from them. 
And so I think LSU is going to do well in the NCAA tournament. Like I said, they're one of, if not the most front to back talented starting fives in the entire NCAA. They're not as deep as South Carolina. Very few teams are. They're dealing with injuries. A lot of teams are dealing with injuries. But when it gets close, when they get stuck, when they when when they have to kind of grind it out, this was not that game. Especially when they were, like I said, kind of given this this reset opportunity at the very, very end of a game that up to that point they were losing. So I think people are familiar with with Kim Mulkey's kind of gamesmanship and, and the way she approaches her locker room and and the way she, her messaging to her players and her messaging to the media about her players. And, and they're trying to build that narrative again, right? They're trying to build that, you know, we're not afraid, of, you know, Angel Reese says we're not afraid of South Carolina. Kim Mulkey is less apologetic about what happened at the end of the game. This is all sort of that internal building up to, to give themselves that emotional boost to make that run in the NCAA tournament. But to me, I'm like, well, it all kind of seems like a smokescreen to cover up some very clear basketball issues, not only just at the end of games. I mean, Mulkey said it herself at the end of halves, they were, they were right there with South Carolina at the beginning of this game through the first half. They give up like a six, six to eight point swing at the end of the half. And then they're down same thing at the end of the fourth quarter, they started giving up, giving up these turnovers, giving up transition buckets and the game was starting to pull out of reach. So that's the, that's the basketball issue for LSU. It's, it's what's happening at the end of these halves. What is it about the mental part of the game, the lightening up when you're in these close, in these close games that becomes an issue. So, you know, I, I think South Carolina is going to be fine. And honestly, if they're not, it's a lesson for next year. I think that this is a long game for South Carolina, really compelled by their tournament. That Tennessee game was fantastic. A lot of things about the, the final were unfortunate, but again, just all part of the story. LSU. I'm a little bit fascinated to see where they go from here because, like I said, I think they have some basic basketball issues that kind of get papered over because of what happened at the end of the game. So that's my piece on the SEC tournament. <laughs> I enjoyed it. There are a lot of really good teams in that in that conference. I, I really liked that that whole week. But we got to hit we got to hit the other stories. Got to hit the other basketball stories real quick. Feel equally as as monumental. It, it was it was a really really cool weekend. Iowa is three-time back-to-back-to-back Big Ten champions. They defeat Nebraska in an overtime thriller. Caitlin Clark had a really rough first half of that game. She comes alive in the second half to score over 30 points. She's passing better than she has all season. Man, if Iowa wins the NCAA tournament, people need to go back and look at the way that they were passing in the earlier stages of this tournament. The assists, the way they move the ball on offense is really really good right now but on defense they they struggled <laughs> nebraska was also hitting shots that was like the game of in terms of like basketball that was the game of the tournament for me just good offensive schemes slashing passes using range and also paint presence i i really really liked that game big loser out of the big 10 tournament was ohio state they probably dropped out of the number well, almost certainly dropped out of the number one seed with an upset loss to maryland good win for maryland i think they're going to be in hannah hidalgo and notre dame win the acc i think i mentioned them last week hit them up for for the momentum that they built at the end of the regular season with two ranked wins they blow out virginia tech in the semifinals virginia tech was the number one seed in the acc now virginia tech is missing elizabeth kitley with a knee injury that they've been a little bit reluctant to talk about the severity of which i understand don't give other teams more time to to scout to to, to plan but it doesn't look great for Liz Kitley, I really, really hope she's able to return for the NCAA tournament, but I don't know. I, I think everyone who follows, like I said, follows women's sports knows that knee injuries are tricky and there wasn't a lot indicating that she was working out or, or moving with the team this week. Notre Dame also just dealing with a ton of injuries. I, I feel for them because they're peaking at the right time and they're also losing players. Kylie Watson was the most recent player that they lost this week. So Notre Dame, fantastic work by, by that group, but the the attrition to the roster is 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 really difficult. USC wins the Pac-12. This is an upset. Stanford comes in in the number one seed, but the Trojans behind Juju Watkins. But there's a little bit of an intrigue to this as well. They take down three really tough teams in a tough conference. They take down Arizona, UCLA, and then Stanford. That's their tournament run. The Arizona game was physical. Juju Watkins did not have a great game. She got a little bit. A little bit banged up in this in this this week. She had some some ankle. She rolled her ankle. She just kind of looked like she was hurting by the end of the week. These are grueling weeks for these players. The UCLA game was was a classic. 
And then, and then the Stanford win, this is what should really worry people because uh, USC is probably going to come in here as a number one seed as, as the PAC 12 winner is Watkins again, kind of, kind of struggled. She did not look like she was moving very well. I'm, I'm hopeful that, that this next week off of, of games will, will give her a chance to start feeling a little bit better because when she plays well, it's really fun to watch, but they were able to win without her having her best game. USC has had a really interesting transfer strategy, which is that they brought in a lot of Ivy league players to complement Watkins as she kind of develops as a freshman. And that paid off in a huge, huge way in this game. She, and so if USC can figure out how to win when, when Juju Watkins isn't hitting shots, watch out to the rest of the field. Really quick, big picture stuff. We'll talk about this more next week after Selection Sunday. But right now, ESPN projects South Carolina, Iowa, USC, and Stanford are the NCAA tournament's number one seeds. In terms of bubble, they have three SEC bubble teams just scraping in Mississippi State, Texas A&M, and Vanderbilt. And then also Arizona, who was really bolstered by USC winning the whole Pac-12 tournament after a tough, tough, tough game. In, in that, what was it, quarterfinal of, of the conference tournament. So those were fun. Conference tournaments kind of are take what you want, throw away what you don't want. They matter when they do. They don't matter when you don't want them to. The real show starts in the NCAA tournament, but a lot of really interesting storylines to carry into the next couple of weeks. All right, switching over to the world of soccer. Did I mention that a lot of really important things happened this weekend? The United States women's national team is the inaugural CONCACAF W Gold Cup winner, completing the bounce back from the surprising loss to Mexico at the end of the group stage. They rattle off three straight wins. One was a penalty kick advancement, I guess, against Canada in the semifinal. We're going to talk big picture on this because in my opinion, to be completely honest, the semifinal in this final, the games themselves were only okay. The semifinal was incredibly dramatic. It was the most beautiful theater you could possibly imagine, but it was simply not a very good soccer game that probably should not have been played because it was played in a torrential downpour in San Diego. The ball was not moving. Players were not moving. And yet there were four goals in this game, which is pretty incredible. Two from the United States, two from Canada. Alyssa Nair proves her worth as a shot stopper once again. I I think I talked about this with the Columbia game. You got to talk about everything but the soccer in this one mentality, leadership, tenacity, bravery. You had to be really brave to play that game. I think there's a lot of criticism to be held for for CONCACAF for forcing that game through in those weather conditions. Then they play Brazil in the final. Also, just, you know, it, it was fine. I think things get tighter at the end of a tournament. It's a lot of playing not to lose. And then maybe... Uh, when you take your chances, you will win. The U.S. definitely reacted to the Mexico loss by putting together a little bit more of a conservative game plan once again. And I am now at this point, I think we saw some really good roster evaluation in this tournament, and we'll get into that in a second. But in terms of formation and style of play, this interim manager period, I just don't think is at this point is going to be particularly fruitful In that way, I I kept finding myself, this is nothing against Twilight Kilgore, who I've always said I think was put in a tricky position and has done everything asked of her up until this point, including winning this tournament. But but when the lineups come out or or the formation is set, if there are things that I want to critique or things that I don't think are quite right, I go, well... Who, who made this? Was it, was it Kilgore? Was it Emma Hayes? I, I just, I, it's hard to tell based on the communication there, just how much the particulars of the way the team is playing right now will carry into the rest of the year. But also this is maybe just reflective of the bind that the U S is currently in, which is that they simply don't have time to make grand sweeping changes in formation and style of play before the Olympics. But I do want to talk about kind of what those frustrations were in this Brazil game so people can maybe get a sense of where the team is at right now and the questions going into the She Believes Cup and then also when when Hayes takes over in June. This lineup against Brazil, you know, standard 4-2-3-1, I think there were, sh- there were shades in this tournament and certainly shades at the end of 2023 of, of the U.S. moving away. They were very they were clinging very much to that that Sweden game at the end of the World Cup the one that famously they did not in fact win, but they did play much better in kind of with that double pivot defensive midfield, really being sturdy up the spine, feeling like they had more control over the game. The Kilgore era will probably be defined in tactic in that just, we liked the Sweden game. We're going to keep building off of that. And we're even in this tournament, as we put new players through and do this roster evaluation, 
we're going to stick with that. But that created against Brazil its own lineup imbalances that I certainly hope are not being seriously considered for the future, to be honest. For example, this starting lineup was kind of fill one hole, but then you create another one where you plug one player in and then that player forces another player out of position, which forces another player out of position. I think some of the main ones that I think people noticed where we still had, we still saw Corbin Albert at defensive midfielder alongside Sam Coffey. Albert had a great tournament. Stashing her at the number six still feels vaguely like some of the experimentation we saw Andonovsky do in the last couple of years in an attempt to replace Julie Ertz. Certainly would rather see Albert and Coffey in those situations than just slotting in Emily Sonnet, so did like that move. But again, still a question of, of what's the permanent solution here. That puts Lindsay Horan at the number 10, which is in a different form, right? You've got coffee and Albert. It's not Sonnet and, and Sullivan, but it's still that hyper-conservative midfield of ball winning. Haran is the, is the most forward playing midfielder. Nothing against Lindsay Haran, who I think did very sturdy work throughout this whole tournament, but this is not a hyper-creative trio. This is about maintaining, I think, sturdiness off the ball, to be honest. And I think we saw that again in this game where the U.S. did not really retain possession that much. And then, I assume this was for rest. I don't know for sure. They rest Jaden Shaw to play Rose Lavelle. Now, in a vacuum, I like this. I like the idea that Jaden Shaw and Rose Lavelle right now are kind of in this alternate state. I think it's good to have backup plans. Certainly they're going to want to go into the Olympics with an A1 starting 11, perhaps with Lavelle and, and Shaw on the field at the same time. But right now, understanding that both players are probably on limited minutes, considering where they are in their preseason and the fact that this was just a very grueling tournament, I'm fine with a rotation between Jaden Shaw and Rose Lavelle. I think they both actually have very similar qualities as players, certainly in their playmaking abilities or abilities to manipulate space and to move the ball. But I don't understand why that alternate is happening on the left wing. <laughs> Shaw did admirably with that, but she's played more winger than Lavelle has. Lavelle, I think, famously played a little bit when she was in Manchester City, and I don't think anybody really liked that that much. And so it's it's like it's like this this one identification I, I agree with that we have Shaw and Lavelle. They're both really talented. They're both really creative. Good alternates to have, but they're being shoved into this into a corner essentially. Shaw does better with it than Lavelle does because Lavelle, that's just not where she plays, which I also think is interesting because I think whenever you see a player's versatility start being tested, I think that's also something to watch going into an Olympic roster. If you have a player that has typically been considered a one position specialist where their versatility is suddenly getting tested, I also go a little bit like that. That's interesting to me. This could be purely about system, but maybe they feel at this moment that they need to see more from a particular player in different parts of the field rather than feeling confident that, that they need to fill only just one role. No one is saying that Rose Lavelle is a great winger, and I'm not sure that Twyla Kilgore would say that either, but I think it was a function of the midfield behind her, and it basically just was a strange use of Rose Lavelle for 45 minutes. She she was pretty much on an island. She wasn't really even able to help defensively that much, was not involved in, in the attack. It felt very much like she was in a position of the field where she didn't feel particularly comfortable. And it was a sacrifice made to make Haran the 10 with a double pivot behind Haran. And I don't know if I necessarily agree that that midfield is so dominating that other concessions need to be made to create that comfort level in the middle of the pitch because the U S did not dominate the midfield. <laughs> they did not have the run of possession. They didn't even really do an incredible job of the, Well, I want to be careful about this. There were some really nice turnovers created in this game. And I think I mentioned in the Columbia game, how important that is uh, for the way that the U S is playing right now, but it wasn't happening consistently. I actually think Brazil's defense for the most part did a really nice job on the ball. So if you're going to play four midfielders, why not just play in a four midfield formation? Why not just play in a 4-4-2? Alex Morgan can can drift into different spaces, push her slightly to the left, have Trinity Robin slightly to the right, get these, these midfielders in the mix in a way where they can actually start creating passing triangles and hold the ball. Again, this is just on the basis of the idea that that's what the U.S. wants to do because they keep telling us that that's what they want to do. But instead, we just got this this sort of strangely imbalanced kind of 
misshapen domino effect, essentially. And yet, it all worked out fine. The U.S. wins the game. On, I, and and for all you know, for all of my, you know, complaining, defensively it did work. It was a very bend don't break. The U.S. was very organized off of the ball. They didn't see it as much, but I think we saw Tierra Davidson and Naomi Gurma do very very well in the central defense. The help defense in the defensive midfield is working. I think Emily Fox's role is is very interesting at this moment because it does feel like she is also doing a lot of midfield work. Which again, why not just play four midfielders? But I'm not the coach. So Trinity Rodman had to come back and do a lot of defensive work. And I think it's a great sign that these players are doing that. This was true for the, the Andonofsky era as well. If, if this is the assignment you want to see these players getting stuck in and, and handling things, Brazil was, was mostly, they, they had to take shots from distance. To, to be honest, Alyssa Nair was not really tested that much. Um, a lot of, many shots went wide. And, and so defensively, this was a performance we're used to seeing. And again, considering that this was the final of, of a very physically taxing tournament, that's that's fine, right? That's what you do to win the game. A very nice header by Haran to to put the the team ahead. Maybe she is the number 10. Maybe she's the number nine. No, I'm kidding. She's she's very good in the air. Always has been. Very, very nice ball from from Emily Fox to find her. So US walks away from this with the win. Some lessons learned for sure. A lot of roster evaluation. Uh, so real quick, I think I just want to hit big picture to some of the standout players I thought I saw for the U.S. over the course of the tournament. Taking the coaching out of it, because like I said, I think at this point, we're, it, you know, it, the, the team is just kind of stuck in this interim situation that I, I'm beginning to be ready to be done with, I think. So tournament, tournament winners to me, I think, have to look obviously at Jaden Shaw breakout star of, of the tournament. She won the tournament golden ball, which was for player of the tournament, huge spark for the United States. Um, but I just can't think of any greater compliment. I think people were, were responding to where Lavelle was possibly going to be playing, but I genuinely cannot think of any greater confident compliment for Jaden Shaw than the fact that United States women's national team fans had conflicted feelings about her being rested in favor of Rose Lavelle. <laughs> That's good. That's the good kind of competition you want within this team, where you have a young player playing that well in such good form, making such an impact that they get rested for someone like Lavelle. And that is a point of, of conversation. Now, like I said, I, I don't love where it was, but I think that that huge compliment to Shaw, certainly in the mix. I think Tierna Davidson had a really good bounce back tournament. If you look at the arc of, of her recent years, she was put in a tough position. Once again, I kind of buy that Mexico game. We'll we'll get into sort of players that I don't I don't know where they stand at this moment, but they the US ran with with the Davidson Gurma center back duo for three games straight. She, you know, Davidson had her moments. She did have that one kind of big bailout moment where VAR didn't take a look at a possible penalty against Canada. But if you just thought about, you know, positioning and calm in the back line with the two of them. I was very, very impressed by that, especially because Davidson really wasn't with the team for most of 2023. So really nice bounce back tournament from her. But some of the new, new younger players, Corbin Albert, Jenna Nyswanger. I think you could put Olivia Moultrie in there too. Those, they, they moved away from her a little bit more as the games got harder. These are players proving their versatility and proving their willingness to do the nitty gritty work. And I think it's kind of thankless because I don't think these experiences always necessarily turn into a major tournament roster right away, especially, like I said, when I'm not sure the coaching principles are as sound as they need to be. But nice longer, newly converted left back did really nicely. Albert, very much relied on, I think, for fitness. She's in the middle of her club season. I think that she just, yeah, in, in many ways, just sort of put the team put the team on her back by being willing to play these this many minutes, being so new to the team. Looked very confident. Trinity Rodman, I thought, had a great tournament. She's another player that really got thrown into that starting role at the World Cup last year in a way that I don't think she was expecting and wasn't necessarily fair. And I think the growth that you can see for a player like Rodman just in confidence in owning her space on the field was, was very cool to see. And then I think the obvious ones are obviously, I keep saying obvious because they're obvious, Alyssa Nair and Alex Morgan, very strong tournaments from them, uh, which we got into in, in detail last week. So I'll, I'll leave that. Players that maybe are walking away not feeling quite so great. Abby Dahlkemper and Becky Sauerbrunn. I was a little bit surprised by not seeing them at all after the Mexico game. That was the center back pairing that, that did not work so well against Mexico. I would have thought that we would have seen Dahlkemper with Gurma at some point, just because they have that club connection. 
And that would be an evaluation point for me just to check in. But I was a little bit surprised to see neither of them make an appearance. I'm sure that there's some feedback there going into their club seasons. So Fia Smith was c- considered to be relief for Alex Morgan in this tournament in the knockout stages rather than someone that the, the team was putting out first. I don't think this is good news. I don't think this is what the team wants. I think the U.S. is at their best when Sophia Smith feels the most comfortable. And obviously Alex Morgan was playing very well, but this is, I think, a point of, of interest as well going forward, which is how does the team continue to empower Sophia Smith and how does Smith continue to progress in a system that isn't always placing her on the field exactly where she is most comfortable. And then also just just some of the the reserves that maybe got less time than it felt like they should. I don't think, I think the backup goalkeepers have to feel like this was a great tournament for Alyssa Nair, which I'm sure they're very happy about, but says interesting things about where that rotation is as, as Nair gets a little bit older. Players like, you know, Midge Purse, Casey Kruger, players that I think probably could have helped more with more time on the field, Lynn Williams. Those are all players that you're always wondering kind of why they're not getting as many starting looks as some of their teammates. Hard to say, but yeah, interesting, interesting for them probably as they have some things to work on as well going into their club seasons. I think like last week, measured praise for the United States. They got the job done. I think they would have been really disappointed not to win this tournament with how many factors were in their favor, not least the fact that they hosted it. Really cool tournament to watch. Excited for Brazil, Mexico, Canada, some of the the smaller nations that we saw in the group stage and in the quarterfinals. Really enjoyed it. Good for the U.S. Lots to think about. They'll reconvene in early April for the She Believes Cup, which is a perfect segue to our quick final segment here, which is that if you can believe it, the NWSL starts this week. The Challenge Cup is on Friday, and then there is a full slate of regular season games the following Saturday and Sunday. Every single player that you liked in the Gold Cup that plays in the NWSL, you should follow. Those are going to be the players to watch, I think. I can't think of a better preseason experience than kind of that cauldron of the Gold Cup. I think those players are going to be bringing it weekend one. And obviously there's a huge international component, roster component to how players are playing with their NWSL teams. Lots of cool narratives to follow there. But let's just get into some of the actual NWSL stuff. We're going to do real big picture because I I don't want to get into analysis that we haven't seen yet. Got some returns that are very exciting. Utah Royals are back for the first time since 2020. They joined Bay FC as the two expansion sides this year. The NWSL expands to 14 clubs for the first time ever. This is the biggest the NWSL has ever been and possibly the smallest it will ever be as they expand (laughs) further in further years. I think everyone is really excited for the return of U.S. Women's National Team forward Mallory Swanson, who plays for Chicago. She lost a lot of last year to a knee injury. Her return has huge Olympic implications and also NWSL implications. And then I think also people are very interested in seeing how former U.S. Women's National Team coach Vladko Andonovsky does with his new post at with the Kansas City Current. Talk about someone who who might be needing a, a bounce back. His tenure at the U.S. Did, did not finish the way that he wanted it to. Very interested to see how his tenure goes in Kansas City. Let's talk big teams, though, and this is maybe going to be a little bit Challenge Cup focused because that is really the the blockbuster matchup of the weekend. We've got Gotham versus San Diego, Shield winners versus NWSL champions. I think everybody is aware of Gotham's super team offseason. They picked up four former first round picks, or sorry, number one picks, not just first round picks, number one picks in the offseason free agency they picked up Tierna Davidson, Emily Sonnet, Rose Lavelle, and Crystal Dunn, in addition to the wide variety of talent that they already have. San Diego, I think you have to look at the the top players of this Gold Cup, right? You look at Gurma, Shaw, Morgan, Kaylin Sheridan for, for Canada. They're going to be just as good as ever. And this is going to be a really fun game. I am certainly hopeful that the international players will be able to play in this game. Hopefully they'll have enough time between Sunday and Friday. High expectations for these two teams. I think both teams are going to be expected to contend for the Shield this year. Certainly contend for a championship. Gotham has definitely placed a little bit of a target on their backs with such an ambitious offseason off of a championship win. But I think they're excited about that. They have not gotten a lot of time together in preseason due to international tournaments. So... If they get off to a slow start, I think it'll be really interesting to to watch how that goes. Other kind of bigger NWSL storylines I'm excited about. They've attracted a lot of international talent. The most recent signing that I think NWSL fans should be excited about is Barbara Banda, the Zambian forward. She is known for her back-to-back hat tricks in the 2020 Olympics, the Tokyo Olympics. Very, very good striker. She's been playing in China recently. She's only just, I think she 
either is just turning 24 or is still just 23 years old. Really nice signing for the Orlando Pride. Other talent coming in. We talked about Bay FC's very ambitious inaugural roster bringing in international talent like Asisa Oshuala. Dana Castellanos, Portland bringing in Canada captain Jesse Fleming out of Chelsea. I just think that there's going to be a lot of really fresh talent, and I, I'm, I'm excited to see. I, I think the NWSL has propped up a lot as a development ground for the U.S. Women's National Team, and that is certainly true. But as rules change and as salary caps expand, they want to be a major player in the international market as well. And also, I'm just excited to see some of these new coaches. There was a lot of coaching turnover in recent years for a variety of different reasons. I think probably every club is hopeful they're going to get a little bit more settled this year. And we're just seeing different minds come in. We're seeing after Juan Carlos Amoros's success with Gotham, we're seeing Washington is going to bring in Barcelona manager Jonathan Gonzalez mid-season. We're going to see former players get a chance at head coaching Amy Rodriguez in Utah and Bev Yanez in Louisville former international managers like Lauren Donaldson at Chicago. We're going to see a lot of different minds come together to try to beat each other in in soccer games. And I think that's really exciting. I'm hopeful that the NWSL will continue to develop its style of play as well as its fierce competition, because that's important, not only just for quality of the league, but I think when you look at U.S. talent pool and beyond, getting different coaching styles in front of them is really important as well. Games I'm excited to watch this week, Challenge Cup for sure. Very excited to see the new expansion teams get their first looks. I think that Angel City versus Bay FC game is one I have circled. Can't wait to see what the Bay looks right looks like right away. I think Angel City is on an interesting trajectory as well with some of their offseason signings. Seattle versus Washington is maybe the other one I'm keeping an eye out for because those are two teams that are very well known, but, but still in a, a stage of transition. Seattle saw a lot of roster turnover and Washington has, you know, continued sort of this coaching carousel. So, and also a lot of roster turnover. They sent two major pieces of that 2021 championship team out this year uh, in Sam Staub and Ashley Sanchez. So they're going to be looking a little bit different as well. They've got some young players that they drafted that I think are going to get looks very, very early, which leads me to my truly final point here, which is that, in the United States, there was the spring forward this weekend. It is springtime. It's time to go to some games. Loved seeing San Diego sold out for the Gold Cup final. The It seemed like the environment in there was truly electric. That was fabulous. We're hearing about WNBA teams selling out their season tickets. And based on those press releases, they're saying this is the first time that's ever happened, which is wild to think, but really, really can't wait to see some of the packed houses in the WNBA and WSL teams are still selling those ticket packages. I think you could tell from the NCAA conference tournaments just what an electric atmosphere the NCAA tournament is going to be. If you've got a hosting team of the first couple of rounds near you, I highly, highly recommend going and checking that out. Go be part of it. You know, I, I, I love it. This is, this is, you know, my pitch to, to people who are, if you're engaged, if you're listening to the podcast, if you're following along online, if you're checking out all the different streams that you have to find to watch women's sports, take a trip, make a plan, go see some of this stuff live because I can take, say from personal experience, and I do a lot of, of remote coverage because that's just sort of, you know, the world we live in, but there's nothing like taking in a game in person, whether it's, you know, Las Vegas Aces, Caitlin Clark, Gotham FC, U.S. Women's National Team, any of it. Go check it out. So that's been uh, my pitch for this week's edition of The Late Sub. Shout out to producer extraordinaire Parker Fenton. We will be back with you next week with more NWSL, more NCAA. Lots of good stuff going forward. I can't wait. <laughs>